All right, here we are. I all right, here we are. I, I think we are going live. I'm gathering in the mind. We are going live. I'm gathering in the mind. We are going live. I'm gathering in. Oh, it's, the excuse me. Out. I need to uh, turn yeah. off oh, the excuse me. feedback. I need, I need to, to actually close the website. Right right now. Feedback. I need to actually close the website. I'm hearing simultaneously what I'm saying. I'm hearing silence later. All right, there we are. So, welcome, Randy Powell, and thanks everyone for tuning in. My name is Bill Ottman, and we're going to talk about vortex mathematics and kind of the global state of affairs right now as we're undergo undergoing this new innovation and evolution in basically every area imaginable. So, hey, Randy, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, so... Just to get started, I was wondering um, your thoughts, uh, if, if you could maybe briefly give a general background on, um, you know, what you've been up to for the past couple years and um, kind of the most current happenings with, with your work and, and with kind of vortex math in general, and then maybe we can go into some more specifics. Sure. independently from when I started working on Vortex Mathematics, which was four or five years ago, um, you know, I just took an interest in it and really started to find that um, I had a talent with it where I was seeing new things, and it took me a while to get there. And I, my intention was never to make any kind of original discovery. I was really just trying to get a grip on what Marco was talking about. I felt like it was something that was easy to understand. It had an explanation. And it was engineerable. So that was really important. Um, and in the process of doing that, I ended up finding a, a totally new solution to the initial work that Marco did, uh, which is covered, the, you know, the beginnings of that are covered in the videos I have online. I'm really, um, you know, I was really blessed to have the people contribute to help me get those videos up, and that was just shot on the fly in my living room one afternoon, you know, just kind of like, here we go, let's, let's put it out there, so... Uh, but I was happy with what it was for for doing it in that way, and um, I think it got across some of the initial ideas about the different discoveries that I made. And since then, it's just been uh, most of those videos were done pretty soon after I started doing that, and then it's been a really exponential process since then. Uh, where, you know, all the things for years that I was racking my brain trying to understand with this math all were simultaneously answered with one thing. And so that's why I felt like um, it was something that I needed to put out there and let people start working with it. And it ended up, you know, calling for a new design to the technology. And that's really the other thing that made it important to me is that it just like the initial discovery, it has an application. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of work studying in physics and in chemistry and in electrical engineering. I'm not an expert necessarily on any of these things, but I've been able to apply the math to, to many aspects of those, enough aspects that I feel like it's, it's a warranted thing for research. Um, but at this point, I'm kind of, you know, I've gotten so much, you know, I know we make outrageous claims and we go out there and we talk about the unified field theory. Uh, you know, I don't, none of us really has a clue what's going on out there. <laughs> we're, um, we're all sort of putting forth our ideas. And to me, what I've always looked for is consistency. And I find a rational consistency and an easy to understand explainability in this work that doesn't exist anywhere else um, once you get a hold of the basic principles and learn how to, how to play the game with it. Right, so for, for people who 
are entirely unfamiliar with with the basic forms involved with um, vortex math, like the the torus and um, you know, kind of the the general pattern with the coil. Do you think you could um, kind of give like the basis for for how those forms connect with? I mean, with the donut and with how that's applied to, you know, physical reality that we're experiencing every day. Sure. Well, the idea behind this math is that the fundamental, we have to really understand, though we understand that reality is unified, we have to understand um, how, to, how to know the difference between spirit and matter. Um, and that fundamentally in everything we're dealing with two systems uh, spirit spiritual world the higher dimension you know some people talk about 56 dimensions or 10 dimensions I don't really look at it that way to me there's the physical world and then there's the higher world which is what we call the omni dimension um, it encompasses every dimension but understanding how that world relates to this world is crucial to engineering anything because it's creating everything in this world. And so we say everything in the physical world is a coil. It is an antenna. Um, it's designed to receive and transmit waveforms and ultimately the ultimate antenna, which is the human body, is the DNA, everything about our body, our brain, is designed to harness spirit. Um, now, I believe you can also tap into that energy through technology by harnessing electricity, uh, magnetism. All of these things come together. And so when spirit is fully harnessed and everything is in its most proper resonance, it will take the shape of a torus or what's commonly known as a donut. And the torus is kind of the ultimate shape for energy transformation. You see it in human blood cells. You see it in the Earth's magnetic field. You see it in gal galactic formations, galactic disks. Um, it's observed everywhere in sunflowers, um, you know, pine cones, you can go on and on. All of these are based on the torus, which is the same, it's a machine. It implodes and explodes, and it accelerates energy, and it metabolizes, and it, it disintegrates and re, rebirths and purifies matter. Uh, and it's a pulsating, phenomena. So you can actually get precise electrical and magnetic moments when you're talking about engineering it, uh, which is very significant. And that's why we say you can do things in physics like get rid of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle because you can actually get freeze frame moments of time. And, you know, I'm sure it'll take a while to apply that to subatomic physics research, but more importantly to me is to apply it on, on the more macro scale to building electrical coils. And the bottom line is grand unified field theory or not, uh, no one's ever done anything like what we're doing with electrical coils. And we know already based on the design, and this was even before my work, you know, are already getting 30% better efficiency um, or 30% savings in energy, which is huge, you know, when you apply that to a large scale. But we're obviously looking to do a lot more than that. And uh, I'm confident now after the TED Talk that we're going to see the right engineers and people come together to make this happen. My goal is really to do it as a public project. It's not for private interest, but it involves the public. It involves, uh, you know, people can contribute to it, um, whether it's through their skills or, you know, through money, whatever. So right. Yeah, the open source model is, 
I mean, it's just we're seeing it rise up and at great rates, and it's great how that energy can be combined in so many different ways, whether it's with engineers coming together or, you know, because I'm sure there's extensive code involved with whatever, um, you know, technological internet systems are going to be a part of it. And so, yeah, I, I really, I think that's a great base that you, that you've all decided for its, um, for its platform. Um, well, that's a, another thing where you mentioned that is, you know, there's a lot of debate in this too about what are the true potentials of it in terms of electrical engineering. I mean, some of the things that we're doing are very unconventional in terms of electrical engineering. Um, they do really interesting things, but no one's, I mean, this is with 9-volt batteries and, you know, the most primitive stuff. No one's done really high voltage, at least no one that we know of. And uh, that's where I think we're going to see different kinds of effects too. But regardless of that, what you were just mentioning, uh, I don't. I think you would have to be a fool to say that there's no application to this mathematics for computers. And we have that on peer review from uh, one of the top guys from uh, IBM. So. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the principle involved with the. Um, propulsion that is going through the center of the torus I mean that could even be applied to the architecture of code when building software or all different all different areas um, Absolutely. and you can scale it up and down which makes it uh, you know when you really start to comprehend and take in the magnitude of the possibilities of a scalar mathematical code like this it's it's mind-blowing, you know, and I, I, I know that not because I really even know much about computers or know anything about coding whatsoever. Right. I know it from the look on computer programmers' faces when I start breaking some of these patterns down for them, and they see, you know, that's all I need to know, uh, because they see it. Right, so <clears throat> for some of the videos that I've seen online about, like, of the small coils that people have have built and and wrapped and you know there's some there, there's some effects that some obvious very interesting effects that are being created is it the type of thing where you could literally take that form and just scale it up by like a thousand and then all of a sudden we're generating like massive amounts of energy is it yeah, the well, that's a lot of where my work is focused on right now mathematically is really determining the potentials because now I mean and this is even since those videos I mean I've discovered multiple kinds of toruses that suggest perhaps ionized sort of uh, you know different charge configurations it gets a lot more complicated than what has been shown way more complicated it's not that it's hard to understand the method, but looking into this pattern and seeing what it really does gets more complicated. But I'm working now with certain specific models that I think, uh, based on laboratory research, um, that these models will have a better potential. I mean, part of what we're trying to do as well is constrict the center, constrict the hole. If you get a tighter hole, you know, you get more compression, you get more concentration of the energy, but it takes a refined level of engineering to do it and not to screw it up. So, right. and so doing the sort of, you know, garage pirate engineering style, all those guys who are doing it are awesome. Yeah. You know, and Jack and Ross and all these different people who've got videos up are incredible. So I always like to say, when I'm saying that this is all primitive, I'm not, it's not a shot at them. Their work is excellent, and I'm sure if they had the resources that they should have, that they would be doing uh, far more amazing experiments. And so um, that's where we're just trying to see it taken. Uh, to we've done, you know, I find the video that I showed in my TED talk amazing. You know, hmm. people um, people scoff at it and say oh, it's a spinning magnet, this and that. But, I mean, I've shown it to multiple physicists, and 
I don't know any, you know, I'm not a physicist, but I just asked them, well, how do you explain that? And I've never received any coherent answer. So, you know, the fact that there's no energy in the coil and we can spin it, you know, 60, 80,000 RPMs for minutes at a time, uh, regardless of whether or not you want to say it's free energy or zero point energy, um, there's application to that. Mm -hmm. But the next step is, can we do that with 100 pounds or, you know, something even greater than that? Right, and that's just not the type of thing that is really feasible. I mean, hey, a garage is just a space, and as long as there are the proper resources being funneled into that garage, then sure. it, it can it can happen, but it's all about, you know, the... the yeah, but there's, you know, when you start dealing with high voltage, you're talking about safety issues. I mean, right. there's, saf there's safety issues, really. When we were at Tesla Tech, um, you know, they surrounded us with bulletproof shields because neodymium magnets are very brittle, and uh, spinning at those kind of high speeds, if they disintegrate, I mean, that's like a cluster bomb, you know? Um, yeah. And, and you're not even talking there about when you're dealing with voltage and putting some energy into a coil and having a chance of something <laughs> blowing up. I mean, no, no one really knows what's going to happen. So it, it, it needs to be funded. I really don't want to see people getting hurt or putting themselves at risk you know, for something that the public should be getting involved with. Right, I didn't mean to come off as, you know, people oh, should I'm just not, be no, trying trying anything with no with no regard, but it, it's it's just the idea that like these these garage or basement experiments really are the types of projects that do grow into the the larger scale situation and um the way that they're doing it single day there's people telling me about how you know we're putting this whole thing at risk and people are going to steal it you know but I say let's all put our work out there it makes us work harder evolve faster and the thing is if you want to say that um, I stole your work then let's go to court and let's see who's got the better argument you know I mean mm. I really feel like we're coming to this point where we have to get back to the way that people used to be, which is that each man or woman, you know, stands for themselves. And uh, we we contribute to the whole and we evolve together, you know. And, um, it's awesome to see that developing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with um, with Gathering of the Minds and what we're trying to do here, I've... I've kind of come upon this phrase collaboration over competition and I think that it's really important because you know as as much as competition is is necessary in certain ways it it the attitude of it it doesn't it it, it drives growth and it drives innovation but it kind of needs to be working with collaboration otherwise it's like it's this atmosphere where people are trying to beat each other rather than make, find the solution. Well, it has to be friendly competition. Right. <laughs> and that, that's the whole thing. It, it's, you know, and I, I feel that there's even something spiritual in that. That I believe that the spiritual world, um, to some degree, is involved with that sort of friendly competition, uh, joking nudges, and one-upping each other for the betterment of everybody. Right. And, and, but the only way to do it is to share, and that's what makes it fun, and it's fun to get out and debate and see, you know, it's like, a, it's like martial arts or whatever, but you know, ultimately you want to be doing it with your friends, and it's not to hurt anybody, it's just to get to the bottom of the truth. That's why, like, you know, I put myself out there, too, because my whole thing is um, I don't care if I'm right or wrong. I just want to get to the truth. So I figure by pushing it to its logical extreme um, that that's the best way to, to call people out, you know. I mean, you can walk into the boxing gym and you can say, 
you know, hey man, you want to spar? Or you can go, I'm the heavyweight champion of the world or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, you're going to get two different reactions. But in the end, I think it fosters the growth, and that's what's cool. And I'm willing, for the fun, not, not to be arrogant or, you know, it's just for the, for the fun and for the challenge to, I mean, and I've done it, go out there with, you know, the highest echelon of scientists and people and just put the idea to the test. And I'm really of average intelligence say the least you know I'm not like these guys in the level of complexity that I can personally comprehend uh, but yet the essential the fundamental aspects of it hold so true that they're able to in some way outclass the fancy stuff um, right it's like and, and there's also a significant difference between competition within like a new energy field and literally you know then it turns into war and i mean it's not i'm not saying i'm it, it shouldn't turn into war i mean war like obviously there's a clash between old energy and you know burning whatever in in order to propel the planet but um you know, hopefully, even as we, like, we, I, I just really agree with what you're saying, because it's like, as long as we're taught, engaging people like Exxon, or entities like Exxon, and um, other major fossil fuel corporations, and, because most, like, it's not about saying, you know, they have, dis you know, have these, had these massive spills, and are destroying the environment, I mean, yes, they have, and they have serious issues, but, at the same time, these massive corporations are going to be the ones who perhaps come behind Vortex Math and and really bring it on to a world scale. So Yeah, and you know, that's why I, I don't, I'm not going out against anybody. You know, the truth is, yeah, the competition is one thing, but it's got to be, I think Bill Hicks said it best, you know, you got a choice between love or fear. You know, and the war comes out of fear. Right. Uh, it never is coming from love, you know. Uh, but sometimes your mom's got to smack you down, you know, <laughs> because, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that comes from love. And so what we're trying to do is to say, look, the first thing is, it's just like uh, addiction or something. you got to recognize the problem. You know, and you got to stop offering uh, these these tired, unworkable solutions. Um, so, as far as I can see out there, and I, I listen to what everybody's doing, there's brilliant people out there, brilliant people doing many things, and I'm sure there's many, many things I have no idea about. Um, but I don't see anyone else out there offering something that's this easy to test and engineer. And that we've already seen this kind of results, and we're showing what we're doing. You know, it's not it's not any secret about it. So, um, you know, in that sense, it's it's really unique, and that's why you know we want to keep bringing it forward like that. But in the end, we have to forgive. You know, it's the only way for us to move on too. Is that you know you can't condemn other people for hate. It's just something that. We've all got to come together, and I think the power of the good people on the earth, the power of their forgiveness, is what has the ability to really make a change, you know? The angry mob is just, it's BS, it's never going to do anything. That's why they call it revolution, because it just turns into the same thing. Right, you know? yeah. Uh, so it's got to be evolution, which is moving beyond. So you mentioned the Tesla Tech Conference. Um, I'd definitely be interested in what other people from the free energy field, you know, what your interactions were with them. And, um, yeah, if you could touch on that. Yeah, yeah well, there was a lot of great, talented people. Um, it was the first time Marco and I had actually met in person. We've been talking on the phone for years. Um, you know, 
it was the first time we actually got to meet and spend a little time, so that was really cool. And you know, it's I know in some way, um, in some ways, I know that uh, I've sort of been pushed out with the TED talk in front of this whole thing. But you know, no one should ever forget. that him, you know, none of this would be going on. And, and the brilliance of his discovery and his ability to, to draw out the initial insights into this, um, no matter what new solutions or complex things anybody else is going to do, it all comes back to that. And, uh, and you know, he, his... His life is a, is an example of um, of staying true to something, you know, and, uh, and he, the way that he's lived and the way that he's kept this thing alive. Without that, without his sharing, my work wouldn't exist, you know. So I don't want it on me to not share and have the next person who's going to discover something new. You know, um, to miss out on that discovery. I don't want the world to miss out on, you know, like I was telling somebody today, years from now, people are going to look back at my work and they're going to go, I mean, it's really cool, but uh, yeah, it was really simple. <laughs> like, look at what we can do now. But in the end, you know, this is what. We're just at the birth of something, you know, where, to me, beyond the science and everything, what this really is, is the birth of the Philosopher's Stone. And um, it fulfills the conditions of what the Philosopher's Stone really is. I mean, ultimately, what we need, it's got to be the saucer, you know, the, where it's your house, it's your spaceship, it's your, it's your speaker, it's your computer, it's, you know, it's your entertainment system. It's everything you could ever want, all condensed into one thing that gives you freedom to move and become one with the universe. And that unity to me is, and the freedom is the, truly the freedom to move and to travel, and that's been the essence of the journey of mankind, I think. Right, and as we learn to harness the the natural areas where energy is stored in increased ways, then th that, that propulsion is, is more available to more people. So yeah, it's, it's just furthering our ability to travel in time space. Sure. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's all, you know, the infinite potential is there. And I think more than anything, People are resonating with that now. You know, it doesn't matter. It's kind of funny, you know. It's just uh, like this overwhelming wave where, you know, the science is one thing and it's all cool, but people don't even care anymore. It's and it's not that just the desire to have something impossible. It's not that. It is this overwhelming feeling coming from the chest, you know that this must happen and in the end it's our only chance you know uh, I'm not saying vortex mathematics is our only chance and to me it's the best one I've seen but I don't know but to do this thing to make this happen um, and you know people who are paying attention and, and we know that there's higher technologies out there and I think just that knowledge in and of itself has opened so many people up to it because they realize, well, obviously what they're saying in academia ain't true because the top guy at the FAA is talking about all their trackings of shit ships bouncing all around, you know. Right, and we and, and people are also aware of the advanced technology that is being suppressed. So it's like and, and a lot of mainstream scientists are familiar with that too. So it's like, it's not just this 
like you said, impossible idea. It's something that we all know exists to a degree. It's just a matter of, you know, taking taking the information that we can that we can get from, you know, black ops and, you know, fusing that with what we can come upon ourselves. But I, what I did want to ask is, you know, because this is all math, if if maybe you could just do kind of a brief, you know, talk numbers for a second, um, just a general overview of, I mean, the most important numbers that you think people need to know or or the, the connections between certain numbers that people need to know? Well, the most important numbers you need to know are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Because <laughs> those are the only numbers that exist. And, uh, and 0 is not a number. It's an absence. Uh, it's a hole. And that's why a black hole is not just an infinite collapse into not you know that doesn't make any sense it's a nozzle it's a jet and it's a hole and that's what the zero is and all the numbers i mean i am not the one to define them um, i can tell you about the properties that i've discovered but they're all mysteries the numbers are mysteries but i believe that all the secrets to all mysteries are contained in the numbers and uh, those are the secrets of the, of the human spirit. And uh, so with the numbers, um, you know, this mathematics is, is very different from conventional mathematics. So while we can approach and answer the questions of conventional mathematics, we're doing it in a completely different way. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of what, what I mean by that. Um, Conventionally, uh, it's said that the base 10 system, which is modular 9 in mathematics, it just means, you know, the base is always one more than what it represents. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. So I guess because it's 0 through 9. So um, the base 10 system is said to be arbitrary. It said that we just use that system because we have 10 fingers, and we count on 10 fingers, and so we just started the base 10. And, you know, there's been all these other base systems throughout history. People counted with base 8, you know, different counting systems because you get uh, interesting factors or multiples, you know, in the numbers. But in vortex-based mathematics, and particularly in my work, I, though Marco initially said this, then he recanted it, and then I restated it which is that the base 10 system is the only true system that's fundamental to nature. Now, you can make a torus... ...with certain other base systems, because it's a little technical, but it's based on a prime squared, and you can make other toruses. But what I found about the base 10 system is that it's the only torus where you can have all the multiplication systems of every single number functioning together simultaneously while having doubling at an angle and forming into the shape of the torus. <laughs> so that's sort of my criteria for what is a true base system. And I am very confident that there's no other base system that obeys that property and characteristic. And so, so that leads to another fundamental difference between vortex-based mathematics and conventional mathematics which is that in conventional mathematics, you have functions which are still, right? Like, plus, and there's four functions of math, times, divide, plus, and minus. Those are the only functions. Um, and all the branches of math are based on that. And in all those systems, the functions stand still. And you have numbers, and the numbers move and change. Right? Right. Um, and in vortex math, it's completely mirror reverse of that. Uh, in vortex math, the numbers are still. The numbers don't move at all. And the functions move through the numbers uh, without having to manipulate or change or approximate it. 
because we say that this math is not a contrivance. It's not a, a human or a man-made contrivance. It is just a discovery. It's something that exists. And the reason why I can say that it truly exists is because it's 100% unique. You can only do it this way. Um, and so uh, back to what I was saying right before that, which was, let's see if I can trace my steps back through that jungle. <laughs> Um, oh, that the, the functions move through the numbers. And, in fact, when you logically consider what a function is, uh, it is a movement, it's a vibration, it's a communication. Um, and numbers are the lattice structure that facilitates those functions, uh, any function. So would you compare the numbers, if, if you're saying that the functions are moving through the numbers, then is that kind of relating the function to energy and the numbers to everything that exists that the energy is interacting with? I mean, like... Yeah, well, we say about a num number that number can never be created or destroyed uh, just like the old maxim that energy or matter can never be created or destroyed we say a number can never be created or destroyed and every number like when you're talking about what's the most important numbers to know mm -hmm. the truth is that every number is eternal and that it must exist in equal proportion to every other number um, and that's what creates symmetry and harmony and it facilitates the, the most fluid motion, uh, the most accelerated motion, the most efficient motion, and which is not in a straight line. And that's the whole thing. It's, it's as basic as understanding the difference between a straight line and a circle and a curve and, and a spiral and how these things fit together and with the torus you've got them all together in one um, I can map the straight lines, the curves the eddy currents the, the spirals, the spirals connecting over spirals and um, it's so fascinating when you look at the patterns that to me there's just this overwhelming sense that something this complex and beautiful could not be um, frivolous and so right. uh, I don't know if I answered your question no absolutely <laughs> I'm, um, let me think you, you wanted more in numbers so should I talk more on, on uh, specifics about numbers is that well I th the fact that it is a mirror of conventional mathematics it's it seems like that's incredible like it's really profound that I'm just I'm curious like so we say that Marco Roden discovered this and are are you all certain that it hasn't been discovered anywhere else in time on this planet it's cuz it seems like for oh, something no, I'm not Yeah. Right, uh, but like... I, I mean, I, this, the traces and the clues of this seem to be everywhere, all over the world. Now, you can look at that from the perspective of conspiracy, you know, uh, the plottedness, the, um, the, I don't know, you know, the, the hidden agenda, uh, or you can look at it like cycles of history, or you can look at it like there's nothing else, <laughs> you know, all roads lead to Rome, and in the end, this discovery is the end of history, you know, um, it, it, the, the true birth of the Alpha Taurus, or the Flux Ruster Adam Pulsar, um, you know, the birth of this Philosopher's Stone, I believe, is the end of human history on this planet. It doesn't mean that we're all destroyed. 
but it is the end of this time, this cycle of time, because I believe, it's like James Joyce said, you know, history always ends with the manifestation of God, and, um, and that's what, you know, we want to see as outrageous as it is. Right, it's, I mean, yeah, the, the end of human history isn't, it's, it's the evolution of a new human. It's not, it's, it's, it's the human that we have been experiencing for this whole industrial revolution. Um, the beginning and the end is all in the same place, and that's at the center. You know, it's at the center of the, of the Taurus, at the, the event horizon, when you cross the threshold. And that's essentially what I think this discovery is um, when it's fully understood and, and implemented. So you, you mentioned Abha... I'm wondering, I don't really know much about that, um, and when I mentioned before about, you know, this mode of, um, of considering math coming up in history, is there some relation with, like, ancient spiritual practices or something that you found? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, yeah. was based on his decryption of what's called the most great name of God in the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith is a small religion out of Iran. Um, it was founded in the mid-1800s uh, by a prophet named Baha'u'llah. Mm -hmm. And Baha'u'llah, if you read his writings uh, incessantly, talks about the importance of this name of God. The, the comparative case is Baha, which is representing the physical world. Abha is the superlative case, uh, the supreme case, which is the spiritual world within this world. Uh, it's an inversion. And he, he talks incessantly about how the God used this name to create the universe. And that if you understood the secrets of this name, that you could tap into the underlying hidden energy of, of spirit, and that um, you could produce a hundred million suns from an atom, or the waves of the sea from a drop of water, and that you could have the secret to every science. And uh, he talks explicitly about this, that you can produce a... a, a fire that requires no fuel and produces no fuel. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just at the beginning of the industrial age. Uh, you know, they were still riding horses and, and living in that time, and, and he was talking about this explicitly. So Marco took the most great name of God, and he knew there was a mathematics to it. Uh, it's called Abjad Numerical System. It's in Arabic, Hebrew, Sanskrit, many of the ancient languages have numbers that correspond with the letters like in numerology. Um, he took the letters and he tried to decrypt mathematically the name uh, in order to understand how to pronounce it correctly. Right. Because the idea was if you could get the proper intonation, produce the proper sound, that it was the secret to intelligence. Um, because it's impossible to gather all the data the data, and we're seeing that now, especially in the information age that we're in, you cannot, you can't take it all, all in. Uh, um, so what we're really looking for is how do you get to the essence? How do you find the secret of everything? The, the key, the skeleton key, mm -hmm. or the Rosetta Stone for all knowledge. And according to Baha'u'llah, this is how you do it. And so Marco put that in practice, and he came up with this equation, um, which everybody's seen. And uh, you can find that on my website, too, or on Marco's website. Um, but he came up with this equation based on his description of that name. And as he started looking at the numbers, and he realized that, you know, there was stuff in here. It wasn't in any textbooks. It's not... And anything known to uh, human beings, 
that he continued, and when he found that he had bilateral symmetry in the numbers, mirror images formed in the numbers, he knew that that couldn't be arbitrary, and so he pursued it for 23 years hmm. until he came to the discovery about the Taurus, and and, um, and that's basically where the math remained until I came, and uh, you know there were some other discoveries made. Uh, you know, in regards to the pyramid, uh, Dr. Nelson and a few different people have made, made a few discoveries in relation to this, but really in terms of the pure vortex-based mathematics and its application to technology, it remained at that point until uh, the discovery I made, which I call the Alpha Taurus. Because it's not my Taurus and it's not Marco's Taurus, it is the Alpha Taurus. It just is a reality. And... and uh, it is the essence of the intonation of the, of the most great name of God. And I, my whole thing, I'm not about pushing religion on anybody. I, I don't even practice religion myself. Uh, but I do intonate the most great name uh, every day. And I, you know, to me, I learn how to contact and communicate with the spirit world through this practice through, you know, basically shamanism, which has been my lifelong interest in practice, and it's how I came to this. And it's because of the sound and intonating the names of God and its spiritual ramifications, uh, whether it be in prayer or in consciousness, um, were so tremendous that it gave us faith to endeavor to take on this this work, and uh, I believe that sound is the ultimate power in the universe. I believe that uh, beyond light, beyond everything, the power of concentrated sound, um, harmonic resonance, is the secret of the universe. So, yeah, in in regard to resonance of, of our voices and, and all sound in general, I mean, I've really been noticing recently the idea of trigger words and you know so we're using language like spirit science god technology all these different words which are kind of focused around the same idea and yet you could you could talk to one person and and use you know the word spirit or god and it would it's a it's it's a trigger word that will completely turn them off from the conversation when you could have just as easily used the words science and technology referring to the same natural you know universal laws of nature that that are occurring it so i don't know i it, it's funny because you yeah, i mean i think we're we're all looking for a new and common language mm. uh, i think it was terence mckenna who said you know we're looking for a language that's not dependent upon culturally sanctioned dictionaries yeah and something that's coming straight out of the bones and straight from the DNA, a true language. Now, do we have that right now? I don't think so. Right. I really think that's part of the next level where we go to a, a new type of language. But at this point, you know, I just tell people, look, you know, you can call it whatever you want, um, yeah. but no one can deny that we're here and... Uh, <laughs> You know, um, that in and of itself is enough of a mystery for me to believe in a miracle such as this. And, uh, you know, ultimately all you really have, because most of our thoughts are borrowed, most of, most of everything we are is borrowed <laughs> and pieced together from, uh, you know, the garments of our fellow humans. And very little of what we have is original and based on inspiration. But when you get it, that's the tr things that transform. And to me, that inspiration comes from the concentration of the willpower. It's really more of an emotional energy than an intellectual energy. Um, um, and the willpower to me is all we really have, it is the essence of how to unite with God's will, or with the greater will, and to be in the proper place, and to resonate, and to know what to do, and have inspiration. 
Uh, you can't get it from the data, you know. But um, when it, you know, now I lost my train of thought. I was. <laughs> um, where did I the sort like the source of inspiration for. Yeah for new ideas or, you know, orig originality versus, you know, kind of building. And here, if, if, yeah, if you want to respond to that, I'm just going to look in the chat room right now because there's been a lot of activity and I don't want to neglect everything going on out there. There's tons of people asking questions and stuff. So, um, yeah, if you could maybe, um, you know, while I'm looking through there, I I'm still actually interested in, um, the, you know, any, any links you were able to make with, you know, ma major f new free energy projects that are going on that could possibly help fund, you know, your research and, and Marco's and everything, um, and, you know, where you're at in, in that realm, in the... Yeah, well, I've got... some people locally here and I'm also talking with some people out west um, one project I'm interested in I probably shouldn't go into specifics about it just because they're talking about how to develop it but it would be a public project which is what I want uh, to do a community project that uh, is, is not privately based so I'm interested in, in some of those and we're really just looking to see some development in this some coils and some experiments and we're also working to get educational materials together and really there's nothing more important than that uh, my real drive right now to get experimental results is mostly so I can say okay look such and such is proven now get off our backs about making some educational materials for some kids you know like yeah. uh, let us do something you know that can make a difference to somebody and who cares you know in a way I, like you were saying about language, I think that's where we started that point that I lost about finding a true language. And, uh, you know, I was saying that your, your willpower don't really have, so you can, you know, you can look at it from the perspective of, well, it's God and God inspires me. Or you can look at it, you know, and God puts meaning into life. Or you can look at it like from a Nietzsche type perspective and you know, God is dead and I'm giving the meaning to life and I'm a will it to happen. It doesn't really matter. In the end, you're putting that in and you're ultimately trying to do the same thing, which is transcend the current situation, which is, it just seems to be what's required of us as, as living beings, as every living being, to transcend to another state of being. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah, I'm, like it's interesting you bring in the the Nietzsche perspective because you know I think one of the big problems is that we we tend to take things so personally if it's not you know the language that we're familiar with. Yet if you have someone who comes forward who has an incredible amount of energy to help whatever initiative, yet you know they say God is dead then that, that's going to automatically turn, turn some people off, but it really shouldn't because that's just language and they're still bringing the energy and inspiration, which is really all that matters. Yeah, and anyone who's communing with whatever you want to call the higher power, uh, anyone who's communicating or communing with that should in no way be threatened by any statements whatsoever. Right. <laughs> you know, like you're saying, it's just language, and you know, you don't have to have, uh, you know, any way to tell you sticks and stones. You know, it's just it's old, old news. Right. I guess maybe the the slight separation between you know God is dead and you know okay yeah we're actually engaging with higher intelligence right now. I mean even so much as, you know, there may be intelligent civilizations in our solar system or your universe that we don't know about. And so it's like, I, I guess We're maybe the, the clash is whether people accept that, you know, he, that 
okay, we're interacting with higher intelligence throughout the solar system universe, or if they think that, okay, we're, we're here on Earth and, you know, humans are the highest form of life. That, that, that's kind of the clash, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, but then again, it could be both, you know? Um, yeah. And I do think that the human temple is the highest form of life. Um, it is the highest form of physical life anyway. Now, I could be wrong on that. I'm sure there's higher worlds, and I'm not saying there's not more developed versions of the human being uh, or um, maybe beings who were like us who are already on the other side of whatever we're going through. I'm sure it exists. I'm sure there's been many cycles of time on the Earth that we know nothing about. Um, but ultimately, I believe that the human temple is designed, and this is part of the teaching of Baha'u'llah too, but that's not really where, I mean, it's part of, I think, the perennial teaching, is that the macrocosm is contained in the microcosm, and mm -hmm. that all, the Baha'i teaching is that all the worlds of all the universes and all the different beings and every kind of life is folded within us and contained within the codes that are written into the human body. So the human temple has the potential to experience every world of God and of spirit. And uh, that is something that I believe to be true, um, while simultaneously accepting the reality of higher intelligence. So, um, you know, maybe as a paradox, but isn't everything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... Okay, well, there's a person in the chat room named Simple with a one, and he says in the fact that lettering can be represented cymatically really makes me wonder what this source was. So, what, if, yeah, so maybe if what I can extract from that, um, if you so could. You're saying, what he's saying, cymatically, I've. I think he's kind of trying, he's getting at the connection between cymatics and actual, um, symbols. So... Yeah, well, what it is, is just that sound creates form. That's what cymatics is, and, you know, um, or cymatics is an example of that. I don't think it's the ultimate form, because with cymatics, you still have two different interacting media. You have the thing that's being vibrated, and you have a plate or whatever it's on, as opposed to having one continuous uh, cymatic organism, uh, which is a 3D geometry, which is created through uh, resonance. And we haven't even scratched the surface of how that ultimately turns into everything we see. Um, no one has, not the greatest mathematicians of all history, have even scratched the surface of that. But we do believe that this is the essence of how it begins in the system whereby it develops. Right. All right, so we've, we've got about three minutes. And, and some one idea that just came to mind, kind of thinking about open source versus or, you know, with um, the idea of, like, proprietary or proprietary intellectual property. So... And like you keep mentioning this idea of both, I mean, it doesn't, I think, you know, we see a lot of open source projects out there right now that, that do incredibly well, um, and we also see many of them struggling. And so maybe there's something to be said about, a you know, a potential fusion between proprietary intellectual property and an open source movement so in order to to not cast out people who yeah, who would want absolutely. to invest and that, that's what we're trying to do as well i mean yeah we want to do it open source we want to share knowledge but at the same time each of us has an obligation to our families and right. and we have to be able to pay our bills i mean i don't you know I, i've had people say i was a charlatan and i'm out to get money you know, I tell people openly, I've made less than $200 in the entire time I've been working on Vortex Mathematics, and that includes seminars and traveling, you know. Right. I've made $200, you know. I, I, we're not out for greed.
read. Uh, I think it's obvious by what we're doing, but um, in order to be able, you know, we are the source of this work right now, and we're trying to transmit it, we're trying to evolve it, but we, we are the heart of it, and unless, you know, I work 80 hours a week in my cafe that I have, Luna's Living Kitchen in Charlotte, and, uh, you know, I do this work on top of that, so it, my life is insane right now, right. and uh, in order, I need to be able to separate from that and to pursue this work on a full-time basis where we can really make the breakthroughs and discoveries that we're right on the verge of completing at this time. Great. And yeah, everyone out there, I mean, just um, for an idea of, of what we're, initially we intended, we're just experimenting here with this, you know, streaming conversation. Um, ultimately, what we want to be able to do is bring in everyone who's participating you know, to a little video module on here and we can make it much more interactive and, um, but, you know, these are kind of the limitations of, of, wh of what we're working with now, but um, here in Connecticut where um, we're working out of, we're just installing servers and um, about to get all of our new code and, um, different technology up so I'm ex I hope you all stay tuned for that and I guess I want to mention so Randy your website is the kingdom.com and vortexmath.com is kind of your guys um, hub yeah, that's a, a sort of collaborative that a lot right. of people from Marco's group are doing and there's also marcoroden.com which okay. is Marco's website <coughs> All right. Well, are there any final thoughts that you have that you want to throw out there, or? Well, uh, you know, I can do this all night. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but um, no, no. I mean, I think you know it was good what we covered. Um, if you know people want to write in things that they're interested in, I'm always happy to come back. And uh, you know, the beauty of this work is we can take it in any direction go spiritual we can go scientific we can go uh you know towards any art philosophy you know right cooking whatever <laughs> so in so right now in terms of you know getting things to the next level it's really it's really about obviously funding source but what have you all chosen like a, a common legal entity to to propel it is or or is that kind of well, in you know, Marco's, Marco's got some things going on and uh you know i've got some things going on we're you know we're we're working together as one project but we've never been able to be completely coherent because we're not really together physically yeah. and uh so we're working on making that happen and there's some good good things happening um, if I can get some of these public projects started, you know, that's an area that I'm really focused on. So there's people out there, uh, you know, I've been contacted by mayors of towns and people, and that's what I'm really interested in. I want to see something where a community wants to come together, they want to see experimentation, they want to contribute to fun research, and let us get in there and work with this stuff with the knowledge of the public. And see what it does, and let all all humanity participate in it as one. So, right, great. All right, and yeah, I just need to give some thanks to uh, John Fellows and Bill Campbell and everyone out there on the board who's tweeting and and you know getting the hype going. You guys for you know helping helping get this set up and all right, there's millions of ma names to mention, but uh, yeah, we're gonna keep rolling. Um, uh, into the new year so Randy I hope we'll stay in touch and uh, and maybe do this again in, in January or something let's do it alright cheers peace thank you take care man